I'm Mark Howell. This is the um, April, April 21st, 2022 meeting of the Fiber Broadband Completion Task Force. Uh, and I'm going to uh, call the meeting to order at 6.38. And I'll begin with the roll call. Uh, Gordon Brockway. Present. Uh, Scott Hopkinson. Present. David Hessel. David, I can't hear you yet. Present. Present. Thought you were being unusually quiet. It must have been the mute button. <laughs> okay, and uh, Gail? Uh, present. Present, and, and myself, Mark Howell. Great, so everybody's here. Um, we're conducting this meeting under the existing temporary authority for remote meetings and the meeting is being recorded. If you don't wish to be recorded, you can, uh, you can leave um, or just uh, remain quiet and you won't be recorded. Uh, in terms of, so we do have some, some sets of minutes to uh, potentially go over this evening. Uh, can, can I have a volunteer clerk for this meeting? Um, I've started, so if you want me to keep going, I can. Love it, Scott. Thank you. And I'll hopefully I can just mail these right after we're done. So. Great. Okay. And as far as I know, the sets that we have available to us at the moment are April 24th. I'm sorry, not April, February 24th, uh, which were distributed on April 7th, and um, April 7th, which were also distributed on April 7th. That's um, correct. Yeah. So I sent a note about that. Hold yes, on. thank you. And has everyone, does anybody have any comments or questions about the the February 24th minutes? I read through them and they, they seem to be fine to me. Um, are you prepared to move to I move that we accept the minutes as presented for February 24th. Second. Thank you, Gordon. Any further discussion about that? Okay, uh, roll call vote, Gordon. Aye. Uh, Scott. Aye. David. Aye. Uh, Gail. Aye. And myself, aye. So that's unanimous. Wait. Mm -hmm. okay. um, I don't. I don't think wait, we have. Oh, wait, 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 hold, hold, hold it. Was yeah. I absent? Oh, let me. See. I don't believe okay. you were. Let me see. Uh, this I is had, the. I had them. I had them oh, I... available to look at. If okay. we, I'm looking at the wrong. Oh, one. you looking. know what? It, it David was absent. Sorry. Okay. That's okay. You can you can vote on, and especially if you've had a chance to review. The, I think David mentioned at an earlier meeting that he got a chance to to review the the recording anyway. So, okay. I'm sorry. What what are we just? Are we talking about the um the the the, the, the uh, April seventh minutes? No, we're talking about February twenty fourth. Okay, April seventh has an error in it. Sorry. Okay, great. Um. Good, so I'm willing to, to go ahead and consider those as well. Gordon, if you have something, you do you wanna put something on the screen or, or make a specific call? Yeah, sure. I, actually, um, what I can do, unless Gordon, you have it, uh, you wanna show the screen, I can. I have them up now for April 7th. Go ahead 7th. and show your, yeah, go ahead. And, uh, and I can edit it live. Yeah, because you own these anyway, Scott, right? Yeah, that's correct. Okay, let's take a look. Hmm. Let's see if I get the right ones because I've got two sets of minutes and I'm might likely to grab the wrong one. So let's see which what pops up here. Yeah, what I have is draft minutes, fiber broadband completion task force 2022 oh. 47 TC dot doc X. There may be a dot, another one. All right. Um, my computer's doing some fun stuff here. So give me a second. Um, yeah, OK. So that. Um...
what you're seeing on the screen are you guys seeing anything from my screen right now no it's blank it says Dark. it started screen <laughs> okay i'll start it again maybe it's um i'll just do it this way i'm out now yay okay and that okay. looks like it's the correct minutes for discussion yep okay and where's the error? And so i'm shown as absent and yet also speaking so <laughs> uh, thank you scott <sighs> so just change uh gordon brockway to present my bad <laughs> Uh, also, Scott, at uh, the end, I said I for adjournment, but I'm still absent. If you follow the top. Oh, yeah. Okay. So that would, you could just delete the line if you want. What's the official? Yeah, you don't really need the line if, if you're absent, right? right? No, but I can't vote to. <clears throat> I can't be absent if I'm voting for a German. Yes, agreed. Okay, you it's just... fixed. I found it in two different places, so I've fixed it already. Okay. So it's absent in the attendance and... No, 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 no. I can't vote for a German if I'm absent. I, yeah, I've, but I said I fixed it. So oh, there's two, there are two, two votes that Thank were you. actually marked incorrectly. Approval of minutes and then the at, vote for adjournment. So in both cases, I just marked you as absent. Okay, no. that's, that's, that looks good. Thanks for that catch. Any, um, any right. updates of any kind? I'm pleased that it says that Gordon was happy with something. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> makes me a little happier today, so. Yeah. I noticed that Holyoke is, has an extra A in it that doesn't exist on page two, right, right below where Scott discussion Washington State example. Um, any further changes to those minutes? If not, um, do I hear a motion? Do, do you see what I'm talking about, Scott? Okay. Yeah, I see it. I just want to make sure I get the spelling right. So I'm okay. just double yeah. checking. Um, yeah, it's just holy oak. O-A-K-E. Yeah, there's no A in it. OK, um, do I hear a motion to approve the April 7th minutes as amended? I, I move to approve the April uh, 7th, did you say? Yes. That's correct. OK, and a second? A second. <laughs> Thank you, David. And. Uh, Further discussion? Hearing none. Uh, Gordon Brockway? Aye. Scott? Aye. David Hessel? Aye. Uh, Gail Heyer? Aye. And Mark Howell? Aye. So I apologize, I was doing editing. Gordon moved, and who seconded? David did. Thank you. That was a close, close tie. It was a, yeah, it was. Right. He's, the, he's the first box on my screen, and it turned green. Got the good so I'm going with that. All right, great. Um, so we just have uh, remaining the March 24th and uh, whatever minutes are, were, are generated from our uh, public meeting and hearing room last week. I have us scheduled for just moving on to the chair's report. I have us scheduled for one, uh, future meeting next Thursday at which I'm hoping to um, generally conclude the discussion that we're going to start tonight about uh, what updates we want to 
um, see to the draft report in, in response to either you know further consideration that we have, or um, or comments that that have have come forward. Um, I attended the chair's breakfast yesterday, and I wrote the agenda before I did that. I don't think that there was anything at the chair's breakfast that is. Of that I noted that was a particular concern to to this group, so I think we can sort of skip over that. I I just wanted to have it on there just in case as a reminder. Okay. And I think um, for future consideration, and we can cover this in next steps at the end. Is we we may want to think about what we'll be doing by way of sort of promoting the recommendations and, and sort of follow up on, on, on the draft report. Okay, so given all of that and leaving that one question sort of outstanding for that, um, but I would like to sort of just go around the, the horn um, with each of you first and, and you know, ask for your uh, thoughts, comments, reactions, either to the reactions that we've received or, or anything else that you might want to say about the state of the draft report at this stage of the game that we, we might want to take into account for the future. And i um, happy to have whoever wants to go first start. Well, I guess, I guess one of this, this question I have for the group, is there a, a formal uh, way that we would um, acknowledge the emails that we've gotten. Um, there have, I think, just been the three that I've forwarded. And mm -hmm. my recollection is the nature of them was four. I think four. All right. But well, the last one we just got, we got three right away, and then the most recent one. Yeah. Maybe. Did I? And yeah, if I, I guess the only way you would know that is if I had forwarded. My my general impression was most of those were related to sort of the specifics about a particular street or situation that, um, you know, is a is a good question. But I think it, they generally fall into the project the the fall into the process of. What about planning broadband projects to address, you know, specific needs? Was so I think that the more substantive comments have typically come in through email or what we heard at the hearing. Um, but um, certainly, I, we I, should... I'm not sure if I agree with that. The last email that we just got was made some rather com strong comments about the financial um, justification for growth, the wheel of growth thing. They, they basically. <laughs> Um, if you yeah. want, I can pull that, that. That one, of course, I, it, are you referring to the email from Mary Hartman that I forwarded? Uh, if it came today, yeah. I, yeah, so it was um, within the last couple of days. And that 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 didn't come through the web page. So I thought oh. Gordon was was asking a question specifically about that. Oh, okay. It, I'm sorry. I didn't recognize or didn't realize that it yeah. didn't come through that. I, I, I mean, they, they are kind of in the somewhat of the same category. I mean, I was thinking, would, would it make sense to create a uh, an addendum and uh -huh. um, just put them in in a, and put it into the next version of the report? Put perhaps and you know. Uh, we could answer the emails, but yeah. actually yeah. this this task force is is closing shop. So it's really more a matter of making of uh, passing the word along. Yeah, I think. Uh, just if I can comment, uh, one of the, Mary's about to become a member of the select board mm -hmm. and I read her comments and I talked to her actually. Um, one of my concerns would be is that we present the report, <clears throat> the select board thanks us, and then what happens? Mm -hmm. Is it a thank you very much, you've done great work, work, and then who drives the passion forward? That was Terry's question to us the other day, I think, but go ahead. And I think that's legitimate. Um, well, I mean, there was a question way early in this whole thing 
there was some suggestion or discussion that one of our recommendations might be that this a committee of this ilk this nature this focus would continue on as part of our recommendations we haven't talked about that in a very long time but that was actually something we discussed brief in briefly at the beginning of all this was would that be one of our recommendations in other words would it would our be our recommendation that in addition to the light board focusing on the broadband business should we reconstitute for example the telecommunications committee that existed in the past that that and put under its um consideration recommendations and advising in the area of broadband mm -hmm. and we haven't we haven't discussed that subsequently so i just but that we did talk about that at one point yeah I think the general question about what what we think should happen next is is a very good one, and and I certainly saw in multiple um, comments the the notion that it would make sense for us to be as specific as as we can be about that, whether it's in the form of a cover letter or uh, a tightened up executive summary, or even um, I saw one request I think for the the summary presentation that we worked with worked on could be could be used. I think those are all, I th do think that it makes sense to be really clear about what we think the, the sort of best first next steps are. Um, Gail, do you have any thoughts? Um, <clears throat> no, I, I think that's a valid concern. Um, do we have a I know I'm trying to remember back to our discussion way back then. I mean, I do we have a consensus about that? I don't know if we've really kind of, I think we kind of talked about it. And um, Gordon, I think I remember you expressing some concerns about governance, you know, um, but um, that's all I can remember. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I think it's important to have this topic, you know, completion of the fiber network in front of people on a regular basis. Otherwise it, it, it won't get done as, as we, you know, mm -hmm. as the yeah. recent I past mean, has shown us, but I'm not sure what the solutions are. I, mean, one, I think that one uh, motivating or driving factor for this is uh, if there's continual continued demand from residents for continued attention to this issue. And that's actually, that's at a higher level or a lower level or grassroots level. That's completely different from, you know, quote governance issue. It's, it's about pressure. Mm. Oh, so just by the way, just as a point, I went back and looked at the webpage while we were thinking about it right now, there still exists today, a cable advisory committee when you fill out the green form, there is still a committee selection for a cable advisory committee, which was really the origins of what back in the day, and I think I've actually submitted a green card ages ago to participate in that. Of course, it doesn't exist, but it is, it's still there and still actually a, um, part of the, the list mm -hmm. that ex exists on the web, the town webpage at this moment for green card volunteer opportunities, as well as such important areas as the bicycle subcommittee and, uh, you know, <laughs> you know, other ones that are probably not nearly as important, but. Uh. Well, I think it does, it does make sense to explore some consensus. I think the way that we've written the report so far, there's a, it generally implies to me that we expect that between um, the town's professional staff with the oversight of the light board, uh, it's worth sort of taking a shot in that direction. I mean, it doesn't preclude doing something else in the future. Um, I am, I'm not certain that, that, that a citizen group working on this problem we get a lot further than than we have until some you know some operational things move forward. Um, 
I, I, you know, and I think it's, I'm encouraged by, you know, certainly by the, the, the most recent reports from, from Jason on what's going on. And I think we've kind of plotted a bit of a roadmap that I'd, I'd be inclined to, to take more of a little bit of a wait and see, you know, see how it lands, see if it gets the focus and, and, and try and do it within the existing structures myself at the moment. I do think, though, that there are some specific things like the, you know, the ARPA funding that maybe need a little bit of, you know, more direct advocacy over the short term. Would to, it be possible? Oh, I'm sorry, Mark. Didn't we interrupt? Ahead, you that, I was finishing my sentence. <laughs> I was trailing off there as I tend to. Um, yeah, no, I was thinking about the ARPA stuff because right now it just seems like there are many opportunities for, um, you know, kind of latching onto these. Um, infrastructure funds and um, you know I think there may be some state funding available so um, I, I don't know maybe we could recommend that if the operational folks think they need help with that or if the select board needs help that they could appoint a committee to help identify funding opportunities I, I don't know if that makes any sense but it just seems like it's kind of a you know we I just feel I would feel awful if we missed an opportunity mm. um to get you know a few million dollars from the federal government that they seem to be handing out left and right just because you know they didn't have the manpower to do it or you know whatever so um maybe that could be something that we just yeah you know i guess my comment you know, along this lines are twofold first of all um definitely there are other, you know, one of the things, and I think it's in our recommendations, is that the team that's doing this benchmark and consider what other municipalities that are in this space now are doing. There are lots of opportunities to do so, and doing that, that overarching recommendation would point very clearly towards such things as what opportunities for external funding or additional funding exist. So that's that's a one one thing I think would be uh, that would come out of this um, recommendation, whether or not there was a separate committee. Um, and so I guess that's, that's one, one of the ones that, that I hope we, you know, somehow gets communicated. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I don't have a, I'm still struggling whether, whether it should be a separate, um, you know, if there should be a separate focus on this. The other thing I wanted to make a comment about, which is, of course, it's one of these Heisenberg, I think there's a little bit of a Heisenberg principle here when Heisenberg meaning when you try to observe something, it changes. And I think, again, the fact that this committee has existed in, in the face of some pretty strong resistance from the light board and other folks has changed the behavior of the operations, of the staffing, of all these organizations, just because we existed and probably it was reinforced by our, our report and some of those recommendations as well. And at the moment, you know, Jason has been, you know, taking this role as the, and they're hiring another te uh, telecommunications director, you know, so the, the, the interest level is on its way back up here and whether that trajectory needs any outside support or not is hard for us to tell at this point is the way I'm kind of thinking about it, which is it's different than it was a year ago because it was on a different trajectory when, when this all got started. Um, yeah. So I don't, I'm, and I'm not coming to any particular recommendation. So if there was, if we did not want to say, let, there definitely should be a committee, then maybe there should be something that says the select board should reevaluate this one year from now as a recommendation uh, at, at, at the least. Mm -hmm. Sorry, it was a rather long comment, but that's what kind of was leading to. An interesting suggestion, thoughts on that? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I think it's a good idea to suggest reevaluating. Um, but I did actually want to kind of build a little bit on what um, Scott just said about, um, forgive me, I'm still a little bit on Florida time. But so I guess the, the point being that, um, you know, just the fact of us having this committee has you know, and I'm, I'm sure it's not a total coincidence, but, you know, the, the, 
having more focus on the fiber um, has brought some more attention to it at the light plant and um, you know at the operational level. Um, so it seems to be a good thing that people are paying attention to this. And I wonder if just a very simple way to get more people paying attention to it is to do something like on a regular basis, have like a newsletter or you know, something that Jason Belger had recently developed with like a two page thing with photos and graphs, or I forget what, what, it, what all it was, but it just kind of summarized, Hey, this is where we are. This is what we're doing. You know, and it just kind of puts it in front of people so they don't forget about it. And that is just a way that, you know, interested people can sort of feel like they know what's going on or if they're not happy with it, they can voice their opinion. And then that would kind of like be an impetus, you know, other than a committee like this. Yeah, by the way, um, one thing which I didn't get into the report, I did put it in the backup slides of the slides that Mark used for the public hearing and I'd be happy to spend just a moment about it now, which was a template for how I would propose the subscription activity um, gets reported. And if you give me just a minute, I'll pull it up so we can look at it now that I've talked about it. Um, so basically, I think if there was a somewhat standard way of, 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 of presenting um, um that information that would be very powerful and useful so let me show you what i was referring to so these are the the slides which i sent around that mark might use and in the backup slide so those of you that saw these would see in the backup slides if we this table when i looked at the reports they have and if this this table and or this table were actually produce this one is on a yearly basis over the entire life of the broadband and this one would be uh, quarterly over a narrow window so the two tables have two different pieces of information because of their range this would help show seasonability this one would show the long term this one the longer one longer term trends um, i think once these are populated updating them would actually be pretty quick and it would be a recommendation that i would make that the light board review these every quarter or however frequently they think is appropriate. It's something on the order of no less than once a quarter um, to just, again, this would be one of, you know, this and perhaps some that are more financially oriented standardized across that period of time would be a strong recommendation so that they, you know, they can clearly see long-term trends reported in a consistent manner. And, and part, of, part of the challenge I think I've seen in the, when I look through all the reports is that there's no, there haven't been the, 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 some aspects of the broadband, it's hard to ferret out exactly what's happening over time, the way, that, way it's reported, so. And um, Scott, I think I recall uh, Jason uh, saying either to us or to the light board that uh, they were working on standardizing the way that Perfect. that information is uh, gathered and reported. Yeah, I hadn't heard that. So my guess is it was a light board meeting. So, well, um, uh, that's, that's, that's a great idea. That's, that's about uh, tracking progress towards the goal. Um, if I've, I've, I believe that this group has endorsed the goal of universal access defined as service for anybody who asks for it. Um, and uh, just, you might wanna think when you look at a chart like that, or maybe who knows what um, the staff is coming up with, not chart, but that table that you just showed her. So those are several flavors of that table. Mm -hmm. um, do those actually tell us progress towards universal access? Well, actually part of what I thought when I thought about those tables was not only that, but um, one of the questions we raised and, and we, you know, is we don't actually know whether the fall off in the last two years of subscriptions is represents a leveling of the, of the market for us. And it's actually another thing that I would propose adding to the, the recommendations that my, and I think I'm not sure if it's in there or not, which is plan for the, for when that happens and, you know, consider, for example, 
rather than hiring more permanent staff, use more contractors so that when it happens, you don't have to lay off employees or you don't have to have people sitting around. But and in fact, I think I also recall um, Jason saying that they've done that. Yeah. So that they have a mix now of permanent employees doing these installations um, with a part that makes sense for them to do sure. and then hired people. But let, let me just uh, pivot a little bit. Let's keeping in mind, you know, the goals that we've endorsed as a group um, and town meeting is in a couple of weeks or a week, a uh, matter of days. It's too late for anything that we recommend to um, make it into this year's town meeting. But what about next year? And that would actually be a year from now. So that's actually kind of in a way, kind of a nice beat because it would give us, uh, give the town, give residents and, and subscribers and wannabe subscribers uh, a chance to see if, if things turn around. And if they don't, what would be the, what would the natural ask be? And I'm saying that, you know, maybe there would be a, a, a potential town meeting warrant in the next town meeting saying, asking the town to vote on and, and endorse um, universal access. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting- or, or whatever else that this group decides is, yeah. is worth, um, you know, we're, we're putting a stake in the ground and saying, we're gonna be back in, in a year. So let's so see what we, happens. We do call that out specifically in the in the recommendations, and uh, it was it was based around some of the discussion that we had um, at one point in the in the process of whether Article Forty One was already an endorsement or not an endorsement, and I think that there was you know at least a little bit of a difference of opinion about that and. I think either way, either whichever side you come down on that, what's clear is, is you could make the argument that nobody really went to town meeting and said, are we as the town actually saying we want to see fiber get to every place? And that question wasn't put in front of the town. It was study it, but the, the, it's logical to do that. I, I want to make sure that we're sort of generally covering the, the report I did hear, hear one thing that I, that I think I want to pick up on. It really is important, and we call it out, that we don't know exactly why growth slowed down. We do know there's a backlog. The backlog's being worked through, but it, I think that it is important to flag the fact that within, let's say, a year is a good time frame. By the time we're sitting here in 2023, it should be much clearer whether or not the slowdown that seemed to start in 2020 was an aberration due to the pandemic or something more um, structural than that. And I think that's an important thing to figure out and evaluate. Two other things that I think are closely related. As I worked on the, the financial section after Scott worked on it and came to understand this internal loan between the light plan and the broadband business, it really occurred to me that the debt structure under which broadband has been operating is really pretty inappropriate. It, it accelerated the payback too fast. Now there's this you know, large amount of money without very specific methodology associated with, with how and when it's going to be paid back. Plus there's a pending debt authorization. And I, I do think though that we should sort that a little bit more clearly in our report, call out what those issues are and recommend that, the, you know, that, that some debt policies and, and debt repayment policies be um, put in place that are more appropriate for the type of investments that are being made. You know, a 20 year investment in fiber optic cable shouldn't be borrowed for, you know, with four year money kind of thing. Um, and, yeah, I think, and we did talk about that elsewhere. Yeah. Um, you know, I think that was one of the recommendations I had put in, which was, yeah. you know, consider the, the fact that the, the capital, you know, and what goes with that, by the way, is not only the debt payment, but the fact that that, that debt 
that expense is by and large translated into capital value. And that capital equipment value has a, a, a useful life of 20 to 30 years. And so paying yeah. back in four years doesn't exactly make sense. Yeah, even yeah, and I, 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 I raised, I, I wasn't happy about that at the time. Yeah. Um, it has been, it, we can't, it has been um, discussed uh, in, in public meeting um, so it's not like as if this just got snuck in there. There is a formal policy that endorses this. Yeah, I, the, I pulled like, it up. Let me just finish, okay? Um, but that doesn't mean that it was the right decision either. I mean, I, I wasn't all that happy in the first place. So, you know, I could, I could use a hand here or we could use a hand here and figuring out what the alternatives were. The, uh, the word was that the accountants told us that we had to do it. But I can tell you, there was one instance in a different meeting on a different subject where I think it was Peggy Briggs was looking over the budget and realizing that they were uh, that there was one of the lines was um, handled incorrectly from an accounting point of view. And that was put down as an expense was actually a capital outlay. Mm -hmm. And when they changed that categorization, it actually had a pretty significant effect on the profit loss stance of, of the of the enterprise uh, that year. So, and that's just an example of what would, you know, it's to me anyway, is accounting uh, black magic or whatever. Um, someone that knows more about these issues could take a look at it and say, you're that that look, this this isn't really uh, expenses being shared and being imposed on electricity rate payers. But it's actually a capital, um, and it, a capital expense that actually represents an asset of the mm -hmm. rate payers. And you know, I mean, honestly, I think that's that's a, if we're going to fix this, change the way it is, it would be along those lines. Yeah, I, I yeah, Gordon, um, this this particular issue, the one that you talked about, because the auditors told us so. I brought Mark and I talked about this and and I think Mark you've talked to Matt about understanding this more deeply uh -huh. yeah yeah and and also I I can't my understanding is that the the schedule for repayment of you know the cash that the cash balance that's essentially owed to the electric utility is not set in stone and is um really able to be handled with, you know, by policy, by a decision of, of the, of, of the um, life plan director, I believe, if not the, the light board itself. And so I, my, my suggestion for our revision is that I think we should clarify what the impact of, of how the debt repayment was handled and the the accumulation of this of this balance that's owed and make a you know a forward-looking suggestion about how that might be adjusted because i think that if it, we leave it st stand as it is it's going to significantly impact the future availability of capital to to even consider doing you know, additional fiber construction projects because it's a 10 year drag to the tune of almost $2 million on the, on the operation of the light plan. And so there needs to be some way to, at, at the very least, make sure that that's being handled deliberately and preferably in a more advantageous way than it is. And I, I think that, you know, I, you know, if I, after looking at the report, going through the whole thing, and I'm sure, there's lots of things that need to be done. But that that was the one thing that I would have to say that I really learned about this, that that I that I find particularly concerning from you know in terms of achieving the overall goal, which is eventually, you know, or at some point getting a program going, which is actually making progress towards finishing the fiber network. That that obstacle needs to be addressed. Yeah, and that's why I put that table in the financial section because yeah. it shows. Mm -hmm. I think it goes up to like four hundred thousand bucks a year for repayment at certain at one point. Yeah, and it's my point is sorry. I'm sorry, three hundred thousand. Yeah, 
you know, that's a pretty hefty drag, way more, way larger than the payment in lieu of franchise fee. Right. So I think we should we should say something explicit about what what we think should should come of all of that. And you know, by the way, it's it, to when as I come to understand it, what happened was the capital expenses for extending the fiber network were not necessarily being covered by the operational expenses. And even though money had been available to be borrowed based on town meeting authorization, and there's still a million dollars of borrowing authorization based on town meeting authorization, what was happening instead was that money was already being repaved based on these accelerated schedules for repayment leaving these shortfalls, which was really coming out of light plant cash. And so all that's really happened was we went out to borrow, you know, up to a million dollars, borrowed 950,000 of it, paid it all back in the first seven years, but ended up owing our parents that same amount of money, which on the face of it makes very little sense. And, you know, if you normally, when you're trying to start a business, you you get a loan and you want to pay as little as you possibly can on that loan until the business is up and moving and throwing off free cash flow to do it. And so at this stage of the game, it seems that the business is generally throwing off some free cash flow. It can't afford to do something, but it's got all this deferred debt that ideally should have been still being debt all the way along. And, and I think that there's it, there, it's important to, to call that out and flag the policies and procedures that, that created that situation so they don't occur again. Mark, let me just make sure people are clear because I, I spent a lot of time trying to suss this out. So table eight, the actual outstanding debt as of 2021 is 558K, not zero. Um, according to the all, each of the incremental reports that came from the light plant. Yes. So we hadn't, we had borrowed, um, actually, yeah, we had borrowed more than a million, but paid back down. So the cumulative amount, actually, according to the, we don't have the final actuals, but as of 2021, we borrowed 1.338 million and had paid back 780,000, leaving 558. But then, but what you said is still true. I just want to make sure you understand. We understood that it hasn't actually paid back all the money that it's borrowed. Yeah, it's, but nine hundred and fifty thousand of it actually has been, according to the schedules in the in the um in the in the yeah. most recent enterprise budget book, which is a substantial amount to have paid back in seven years, given that you were only authorized to borrow a million in the first place. Yeah. Uh, uh, all right. Yeah. So and I mean, that's, that's the area where I actually had some troubles trying to reconcile. Right. And the reconciliation is not clear and it should be clearer. Right. And I think anything that we can contribute to to either, you know, focusing on that reconciliation is is important to do. Yeah, I mean, um, I, what I tried to say a second ago and just bear with me is I'm not even sure it needs to be paid back. No, I, I agree. You, there's there's nothing that says that it has to be, and if it doesn't have to be, then that's a whole other, you know. Yeah, I mean, you'll hear people saying, "Well, you can't have the uh, the, the the electricity rate payers subsidizing the mm -hmm. telecom subscribers," but and and it's it's easy to say, "Well, okay, that's it. That's the end of the discussion." But this is like I said, it's about equity. It's about um, it's an investment. And it doesn't, you know, and so it's anyway, also, I'm not an accountant, but yeah, um, I do think it, it does bear, bear some looking at it. And why I, that's why I mentioned that Mark had told me that Matt Cummings was looking into this specific yeah. thing. And we still have a pending response from Matt. I suspect as a accountant and a CP, I'm assuming he's a CPA, he would be pretty thorough on coming back with a yeah. crystal clear answer on this now that he's thinking about it. That, but, but that's my assumption. I, I do, I do think that if we are truly on the track to pay back a million nine and we've already paid back a substantial portion of it, that those two 
that repayment table and what we've already paid back don't go together. And so hopefully he'll resolve that. And yeah, and I think what, what I think we really do need to do is clarify at least what the questions are. Um, if not, make some statements about how to how how to address it, you know, going forward. Because otherwise, in, you know, I do think that this, the, you know, this financing for the startup probably could have happened in a little bit, you know, more advantageous way. And and so this would be pointing towards that. So, you know, kind of answering my own question that brought us into this discussion. I think that the, the, the two things that I think we want to enhance about the report are this handling of, of the debt and capitalization of the business, and at least recommending that that be made crystal clear and some, you know, some clear forward looking policies about how it's to be handled in the future be done. And the other one is that I do think, you know, sort of to your point earlier, Scott, about should, or maybe it was, was Gordon, check back in a year. If this business hasn't returned to its traditional growth rate, you know, which I'm defining as 195 subscribers a year, within the next year, you know, assuming that the pandemic is generally abating, I would think that that would be something that would be cause for at least, you know, some further and fairly careful study by either a follow-on group or somebody else. So, um, did anybody else have comment? I see Carlin has her hand raised and we could take a comment here if we want to. Go ahead, Carlin. Thanks, Carlin Reed, 83 would send. On this very point, I remember attending and hearing about this topic discussed before the Financial Audit Advisory Committee. I'm looking at the minutes right now on the FAAC for September 17, 2019. Take a look at those minutes, track the minutes from that date forward, and look also for the CMLP calendar year 2018 financial and management letter. That's where I think this topic started to be discussed along the need for breaking out broadband from the light plant. So take a look at that again, se September 17, 2019, minutes from the Financial Audit Advisory Committee. And then track that forward going through the minutes to see how that progressed. Also the CMLP calendar year 2018 financial and management letter. That's it, thanks. Got it, thank you. Th those sound like what maybe I might've forwarded to, to you. Um, yeah, because, you know, just to, to be clear, I did approach Matt Cummings, the, the finance um, director at the light plant for his take on it. And he's the one that explained that it was these shortfalls in the capital accounts that were, you know, being, you know, coming from cash that, that appear to have created this balance. And I did also um, speak with Wendy, Wendy Ravelli, who is both the current chair of the light board, but also a member of the financial audit advisory committee to ask her whether they had weighed in on it. And I think her, if you know, this is to paraphrase what she was saying, she said that she didn't feel like they had necessarily um, had a chance to look at this specifically because they haven't, um, as I understand it, they haven't met in a while. Um, so I think that what Carlin was just referring to might have been part of that discussion as, uh, as those audit results were coming out, but it doesn't appear that there's been any real policy made on, on this topic. And I do think it's an important it, one. No, there has. Yeah. Well, I mean, there, there is has. a policy that was it, that we, in response to the auditor's requirement that you have something in there, but yeah. Yeah, um, let, let's be clear. This is this has been implemented, and it's it's the implementation that we're questioning, not whether or right. not it's been addressed. Yeah, and so right. basically, the, the, I think what we're trying to we're talking about here is maybe turning the ship around. Yeah, right. Because I think that it if you take that schedule of repayment of this cash balance in in and, and plug that in, because I I don't see much. It, it starts off low and, and gets 
pretty big, pretty fast, but you don't see much of it in the, in the actual um, forecast for the, for the light power, for the um, telecom division. And that I think really does represent a problem if we turn around and say, and oh, by the way, go spend a quarter million dollars a year on building fiber to unserved homes that they, they're not gonna fit together unless yeah. there's a whole lot more growth than we've seen. And so, you know, addressing that plan, either, I think we either need to leave the, leave some specific milestones to hit about that, or we need to recommend that somebody, you know, to, to the other point that somebody come back and, and take another look at it in, in fairly short order. Um, I wanna hear from, from, um, from others. Is there anything else that, that people, uh, saw either in the comments that we received or, or impressions that they had themselves that they would like to um, see us address in the, yeah, in the um, graphic vision. I'm not sure if I can express this correctly, Mark, um, and the committee. It seems to me, um, Jason has a plan in place, but I don't think anywhere we're saying as a committee that and it, we've kind of touched on it. Mark, you said 195 new signups in 2023 or two, did you say? Well, I was thinking that in 2022, that if in a year it isn't apparent that, that that growth rate has been resumed, then we need to question whether it's going to resume. Okay. So I guess we should, I, I think we should put something in the report that says having Jason in place, having new hires in place, how do we say in the, or should we say in the report, if you don't reach that target, and I think the target, by the way, that we saw previously was higher than 195, but I'm not positive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we uh, saw it's closer to 300. At right. The peak. Yeah, but Mark, I think Mark just chose a date. One of the right. Yeah. So you got you to discount. Uh, they can't do it in the winter, so it's right. Two or more I, think twelve. I think there's conflicting targets. At any rate, should we not put something in the report if 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 this is if we are revisited a year from now and straightening out the financial issues? Um, thank you, Scott. Um, that, that's the total net subscribers. So, um, let me just look right. at this. It doesn't have the delta in here. I, I apologize. Yeah, yeah that's, that's okay. But but obviously, to 2020 and 2021, the year over year growth rates were um, five and three percent respectively. That's that was where the red flag comes from. Yeah, the the 195 was the average change for the years 17, 18, and 19. Okay, so average growth rate, okay. Or, for over, or, over the past three years. So the question I have is looking out one year from now, after Jason's efforts and changes to strategies and so forth, more marketing, more whatever, should we put something in there that says, if that small 195 rate is not achieved, how do you look at then the whole process of bringing of the goal of bringing broadband to everyone in the town? Well, that's if, a good question. In, um, let me write this down and then I'll make a comment. Uh, hold okay. on. And, 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 and the, the, um, the 195, I am mean, making an assumption, I hope it's fair, that the 195 is still the easy marks, not the hard marks to make. Yeah, well, that's actually what I was gonna make a comment about somewhere around the, this, which is the 195 is representative of the, you know, um, what what percentage of those that we already have passing um, have we saturated? And is 1500 out of the, I think, what is the total we have that are already passing optical fiber was somewhere near 4,000, right? So 
can't does that represent a leveling and or not and again we don't have that information yeah I'm just, what, I'm just, what isn't what is interesting to note though is we we we've tagged the the number of served premises in other words served premises that we passed in the data at 6131 right and so 195 which is would be returning to a pre-pandemic growth rate average over the last three years represents a three percent increase in take rate within that number every year so right. today's take rate is 25 to do that in this year would mean take rate goes to 28. Another year later would mean take rate goes to 31. And that would, you know, assuming no further expansion of the network itself. So it, I, I think of that as just kind of getting back to business as usual after pandemic disruption and it's if we're not there, then we have to worry about the fact that we may have reached the natural limit of take rate, and, it, and that would, of course, be a be a concern too, because that you know all of that is what creates the financial flywheel that we've been talking about that might allow this to pay for expanding the network. Right now, I don't think there's enough cash in the business to do much in the way of you know make any real progress on on expanding the network so it needs to grow some in order for that to occur that's my opinion i yeah i, I understand that but i i guess what i'm asking is if we revisit this in a year and the growth if if someone revisits this in a year mm -hmm. and the growth rate is 195 or in that range mm -hmm. what becomes the position of the people revisiting this and should we should we address that issue? Yeah. Uh, maybe more completely, we can say, you know, if it's below, if it's, you know, maybe just to be complete about it, David, is something along the lines of if, you know, if it's 150 or less, then, you know, big red flag, 200, it's going to go as, as it is. And if it's north of 250, pick another number, um, then that's indicative of a different trajectory of the business I, I don't know if we need to be that specific or yeah not, I or just, yeah, I'm just concerned. the other important metric is the backlog and I'd like to see the backlog drop uh, get driven towards zero right uh, because I'll tell you what that huge drop backlog is also in a way obscuring uh, what other um, things are affecting the growth yeah. rate of the business and, and by the way I... that... go ahead I'm sorry, I, I, go ahead and finish uh, the backlog. Yeah. Is, so I think one of the things it's, it's I've hiding. heard recently it's, it's, is that it sounds like Jason mentioned the last time I heard the backlog when they scrubbed it is now down to 80 to 90. Mm -hmm. And they're very sensitive to the fact that if someone has to wait two months before they get service, then Comcast is getting a call because they just, people don't want to wait. Yeah. And I don't yeah. blame them. I mean, this connects to the take rate right we're, we're speculating what the take rate is but so long as the, the backlog is measured in years we don't have the slightest idea of whether or not how close we are getting to the upper limits of the take rate mm -hmm. so you, you need to drive that backlog down so we can start to be responsive and mm -hmm. then you know talk about the take rate it's like okay we're at 25 percent. what can we hope to achieve well as we start to approach it let's say the take rate is 33 percent then we start thinking about, hey, maybe you could sell the service to Comcast mm -hmm. users, which sounds crazy. But if you're, if some of the users are interested in resilience, mm -hmm. or if they're interested like me, I'm a Comcast user and I'm incredibly frustrated by the upload speeds. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, and I'm not going to give up cable. I'm just not going to do that. Another so I could way. end up with both. Yeah. Mm, interesting. Another way to understand the backlog, though, is that because there has always been a backlog, we can conclude that that the actual limit on growth has been the resources and the capability to deliver the service to anybody. Yeah, because the the mere existence of a backlog means that you haven't been able to do all the work that you that's been ordered. 
And so that that's why it is incredibly important to, to try to reduce it. And the interesting question there is if the order rate goes up as the backlog drops, then it means there was latent demand out there for people who just weren't ordering because they've heard they can't get it. But once they hear that, you know, that it can be delivered in a reasonable period of time, then they start moving. If you get to zero backlog and nobody walks in the door to order any order it again, that tells you something else. Well, and that's where you start advertising or yeah. uh, looking at your, you know, take it really abstractly. I was listening to an interview with a logistics expert talking about that pile of ships waiting to offload offshore. He yeah. said, if you look at it from logistically, you've got a queue with multiple uh, steps in the process, right? A systems analyst will always ask themselves, where do you want the queue to be? Where do you want the line to form? There's always a line. You can't get rid of the line. Yeah. And by addressing, you know, changing the design of the, of the system, you can move that backlog to mm -hmm. different places. What you just described is ex exactly it. It goes away from the, the you know, you uh, solve the installation problem, you're gonna end up with another limit. Yeah. And what I like about, what I don't like about the installation as being the limit is, is that it tends to obscure yeah. what's really going on. Mm -hmm. yeah. but except, I think that... except in our case, the queue can be resolved by a competitor. Yes. That's a little bit different when you talk about queue theory. Yeah. <clears throat> There's a competitor who can install tomorrow or close to it. Yeah, but, I, right. um, we should we should look at that, but I'm, I can't believe that we can't do better with that. Um, you know, then in fact, one of the emails, uh, sorry, um, Gail, one of the emails was, hey, how come you, right? It was about undergrounding to his house, right? Right. Yeah, so I, um, I mean, I appreciate the sentiment that like there should be goals and if they're not met, then like maybe some reevaluation should occur. But I, I guess I just feel like the numbers are, are somewhat arbitrary. Um, you know, we've been in the pandemic. We don't, we're not sure how much the pandemic has impacted the demand for the service. And, um, you know, it sounds like there is the fiber network is being expanded a little bit. So, um, you know, the six, 6131 is gonna go up slightly. So I, I guess I just, I, I, I wouldn't feel comfortable saying, oh, if we don't get to 195 by this date, then we should do something in particular. I mean, I think it should be something that should be looked at periodically. Um, and maybe we can make some recommendations about well, actually, I don't know. I guess I'm just not comfortable giving a number for, oh, the goal for this year should be X because I think there's too many variables. Mm -hmm. I, I, unique. I think you know, I, 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 it's not that I wanted to set a goal. It, it, it is more that it, it appears that there are more resources in place at CMLP to improve the take rate. <clears throat> they, never be, they never before. Yeah. And so from a straight if, if i was running this business and put more resources in place my i would anticipate that i would increase my performance with those resources <clears throat> and so i'm trying to figure out <clears throat> what would be reasonable what would be reasonable expectations with those increased resources yeah but 195 would... or two I was going somewhere down that road too. And, and so my answer to what would be reasonable is a return to historical norms. Okay. So it seems to me that if, if there's an inability to get back to what had historically been occurring, then one needs to ask the question of why did that happen? Hmm. You know, because what we're really just saying is it have the effects of the, of, you know, whether it had been short staffing, which was did occur, short staffing occurred almost coincidentally with the pandemic and persisted through a portion of the pandemic and has been resolved at approximately the same time that the pandemic is, is also abating. So one would hope that that means that you get back to normal. 
And that's all I'm saying is if we don't get, if the business hasn't appeared to return to normal, then I think that's deserving of, of some very, you know, much more serious consideration. If it does return to normal, your next question, David, was a really good one. Well, what does that mean you can do? Right. Uh, if I can add, if I can add, one of the conversations I had with Mary Hartman was, and I, I'm not a tech techie person, the, the differentials between certain systems, but one of the kind of open conversations we had was, and it's specifically for Concord Green, we can't, we're beyond the, pe the point of, 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 of putting in conduit because we start paving tomorrow. <clears throat> um, but would 5G be an answer here? Mm -hmm. Would that solve the high expense of conduit and so forth and so on? I don't know that answer. Maybe someone can give me that answer. And then is that a suitable answer for CMLP? I don't know either one of the, I don't know if that's the right question and I don't even know the answers. Yeah. No, I mean, I think I can give you some comments. The notion of fixed wireless, fixed cellular has <clears throat> been widely deployed in the Far East where they have the same problem, even as it relates to stringing phone lot wires to buildings, never mind broadband. Um, however, the goal of this activity because of the charter and, and right. the direction we came from was to not actually not think about all the right. wireless and you know microwave i mean there's a zillion different technologies that we could that are in the over the air so to speak uh everything from satellite to others uh, that we might have considered I and, recall, yeah, yeah and i think the short answer is yeah there's there is technology i I'm, i may have I know I've told one of at least one or two of you that when my my Concord broadband went down because of a local device issue, it wasn't it was in my basement. Um, I fired up my cell phone and turned it into a hotspot and just for the X of it measured the bandwidth and I was getting 100 megabits at my house, you know, just over the cellular network. It's the one thing to bear in mind with these approaches is that it is shared bandwidth, which. And if you've ever been in a situation where you're using a lot of bandwidth and it's shared, you'll discover that there's individual sampled bandwidth at any given moment that maybe that pick a number, it's a nice big number, but all of a sudden, if everyone is doing it, that gets okay. divided down and all of a sudden the number isn't quite so exciting. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I think that I think the solutions are broader than just 5G delivered by a telecom um, like Verizon or whatever, that's like uh, there are implementations that that the light plant could do. Would right. use to, perhaps use five G technologies, um, but it would be a last um, three hundred feet kind of technology and wouldn't necessarily involve base stations and the mobile network at all. Okay, I didn't, I didn't want to get too deep. I just something we discussed. Yeah, I think though maybe the the thing the thing that we should call out is. There are other potential solutions, especially for certain MDU types of situations that are, you know, some hybrid of, of fiber and some, some other existing, you know, wire, wired or wireless technology. Um, there are some, you know, apartment buildings often have some ability to you know, you can reuse the phone wires or you can reuse the existing cable infrastructure that inside the building to avoid that, you know, last 50 feet problem of getting from a wiring closet to, as well as, as the um, wireless options are being, you know, developed by the industry. And I think that it's, well, yeah. when, when we talk about the, the, you know, the last hundred foot problem, that's evolving and it always needs to be looked at. I, I, you know, I appreciate that, that our mission here was to try and figure out how to, how to solve the problem of the 20% of people that haven't got fiber at all, recognizing that there are some that are gonna be even tougher than, than just, oh, we need to build it on your street the way we've already built it in other places. That's, you know, so there's kind of two, yeah, two flavors to that problem. 
One of the frustrations here, I think, is, is that because of the backlog mm -hmm. and because of the uh, financial prioritization scheme where we were wanting to try and tackle the least expensive, easiest um, cases first in order to uh, quickly get to profitability, that pushed the harder cases to the complete back of the priority list. So the organization doesn't have, it's not developing the quote learning curve, right? The institutional knowledge of how you actually um, install in a complex MDU like uh, Concord Green or even a simpler one, because we just haven't done it very many times because it's way down on the priority list. There are easier ones that are going to make us more money. You're going to be easier to do. And we'll be able to have a higher throughput. And at some point, like if we drew at some point, that's going to have to change. And I'd actually prefer that they'd start developing some of that know-how and experience now, rather than when it suddenly becomes really urgent. Because, you know, if you just dip your toe in the water, you get some experience with it, that's a lesson learned. You can carry to the next thing, next project. Well, I mean, I think that was... In that vein, that's why I think they should be doing some pilots with, you know, direct buried fiber. You know, one thing that we don't know, and even though we did find places that do, like Washington State, that do direct buried fiber with a vibratory plow, we don't know what that looks like when you get to winters like we have, you know, and is the 18 inches a good number to bury it? You know, is there expansion and contraction problems that come into play? I actually, I mean, I had a one of these things. I did something for a sailboat in which caught me by surprise, but we put together a, a instrument lighting system and it turned out it was for a friend's boat and the expansion and contraction of different materials ultimately caused the thing to fail. And it, 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 we didn't anticipate it, didn't have enough information, but until we actually tried to do it once, we discovered, hey, great idea, except for that we had this one challenge, and so we had to change the way we did things. But you don't you don't want to roll out a large deployment of that and discover, oh, oh wait a minute, we maybe we should have done something slightly different, and it could be just a material selection uh, mm -hmm. for the fi fiber. You know, that's yeah, why it was great. Really but th these are the kinds of things that we do need to get started on, and and. Mm -hmm. through all this discussion we haven't yet yeah. through all this discussion and a year's gone by and i don't know if i could call up the folks at the light plant broadband and say have you done a direct barrier optical cable you know mm -hmm. i'm guessing the answer would be no based yeah. on the email we just got you know that's why that email was so shocking to me you know I, I don't I think we should make some pointed recommendations that some pilot if you want to call them pilot projects or pilot test <laughs> you know yeah. um projects be done like you know pick an mdu and and try some technologies and you know other folks have done this like i you know i mentioned the city of chattanooga with this um, utility they have called epb and they do electric and um, fiber and they have the whole town wired including mdus and they've been around a little bit longer they started in 2010 but it's it can be done someone's done it and you know so folks could talk to them talk to other um you know other more local climate uh analogous towns and see you know what they do but you know i think i think we should encourage the telecom folks to get started with you know some ideas and see how how it goes i tried to um allude to that in the sense that you know, some of these pilot projects about installing electric vehicle chargers or, you know, that have been undertaken already by the light plant are, are similar in that vein. It's nobody knew exactly what it was going to take to put in an electric vehicle charger, but they did pick a likely location with an interested party and go ahead and actually do it and, you know, learn something from it. And that's, that's why, you, you know, piloting and testing it. So I think, that's a good suggestion that we should. So we've alluded to the better construction techniques, and I think we can can also improve that suggestion by saying, you know, by the way, um, you know, within a reasonable period of time, you should have, you know, at least tested this somewhere. Maybe there's, you know, maybe going out the back of substation two nineteen over to the Concord Muse, formerly known as Concord Muse project 
over light plant land onto other private property so that it's out of the right of way. It's not likely to, you know, it's away from a lot of things that, you know, are otherwise, but it might be an interesting place to use a vibratory plow just because you can and, you know, install something just to, yeah. just yeah, to say that. By the way, um, you actually, I think, uh, you know, we, oh, sorry. No, I would say, yeah, I have to be cautious. Um, you actually could do it here mm -hmm. because we have one location that I'm aware of that you could do it without upsetting our roads. However, that being said, I might be hung by the tree if we do it in one building and not all buildings. So I'm not sure I want to volunteer <laughs> that's, that. that's why I was studying your map, David. Yeah, and I haven't yeah, finished sure. doing that, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and David, you, you may be able to bring it into a common area mm -hmm. and that that oh. wouldn't... I, I uh, think 70 Beharrell does have that date. Um, Mark, yeah. you would know for sure, but I believe what 70 Beharrell, which is a, an apartment building there in West Concord, um, they brought the fiber into uh, telecom and they have a switch there. They have an ONT and a switch and it's ethernet to the apartments. That's my understanding. I haven't had chance to go investigate yet. Is that correct? Mark, do you know that? Sorry about, the, sorry about the chuck wagon commercial in the background. Somebody wants to be fed. <laughs> um, so, um, so, Mark, my question for you was, does the 70 Beharrell, did they not put in a ONT box and then have an Ethernet switch? Actually, what happened was in that particular project, you know, sort of traditional bring the fiber into the building was done with, I don't know, a six strand or a 12 strand or something like that to a rack of ONTs, which was co-located in a closet with Ethernet. So okay. it's, a, it, it, it's not, it is sort of a hybrid in the sense that you're going from a, a main closet to, uh, to the individual units using something other than fiber, but it's not, uh, it's, or is, it's is there a one the, is there the one one ratio? Excuse me. I'm sorry. Is there a one one ratio between ONTs and users that are hooked up? Um, it's the type of ONT that can support four Ethernet ports. Oh, okay, so okay. You okay. can have up to four subscribers on one ONT because each one has their own dedicated port. Okay. Um, I'm going to so let's let's shift gears a little. Um, I see it's getting getting to be eight o'clock. So there's two things I want to do. I want to want to talk about um, specifically what we want to look at um, next week. And the other thing is, you know, I Jason Bulger has been on this meeting, and I know he had contacted me about how much time he had to give us feedback on the on the draft report. And so I was going to give him an opportunity if there were things he wanted to say. Um, tonight to to all of us that would be great otherwise we could await some some additional feedback from him too because uh, I, I think those would both be useful for us to do so I'm happy to do those in either order but just to summarize the notes that I've been taking um, answering the what what should happen next quest question in general and in specifics I think is important um, we talked about the fact that that grants um, pursue you know, pursuing other funding, you know, trying to determine whether or not it would be useful to make a recommendation about how that takes place it would would also be something we could get involved with. Um, the the milestones, the whole question about what what specific goals and, and when might they be achieved, um, growth rate goals and those kinds of things. Um, standardizing uh, the long-term data that's available, I think is something we wanna pull out and be more specific about. Uh, we talked about how to return to growth, how to re reset the sort of expectations around how um, debt and capitalization is, is done and try to understand what the impact of that might be on the available resources for a capital plan. So I think those are 
Um, and then alluding to the fact that there may be other solutions that, you know, technology solutions and, and installation techniques that, that it would make sense to at least pilot for, for feasibility and some of the difficult situations. So I think all of those are, are good suggestions among the sort of clarifications and things like that that are useful for, for um, what people have said in the report. So did I miss anything from our discussion just now? Good. Jason, would you like to add anything? Sure, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Uh -huh. um, hi everyone. So um, thank you all for your comments. I'm gonna refrain from making any recommendations. I'll leave that to the committee and I feel like it's with the task force. I feel like it's your job to make those recommendations to the boards and, and uh, the staff and the, and the citizens in Concord. Um, but I can say that I did review the executive summary of the task force's report with the staff at our uh, weekly staff meeting this week to go over what was uh, there. And um, <clears throat> I also mentioned to them the low-hanging fruit that I feel like came up uh, at many meetings and also was summarized well at the, um, at the hearing that you guys held last week. Um, some of those things were reaching out to the MDUs and establishing communication with them so that we understand what the specific obstacles are to those. Um, providing real estate agents with marketing materials, coordinating with engineering and highway for paving projects so that we can try to get projects in before paving happens, um, creating more marketing materials so that our techs out in the field have the ability to um, distribute materials if they see somebody or help them answer questions uh, to create more opportunities for growth and sign up, reaching out to nearby customers uh, when we're doing an install. Uh, letting people know who might have fiber access today that they currently have access and could be signed up really easily. Um, I think Scott had mentioned that. <clears throat> and then also exploring the notion of fiber hoods. So we've we started talking about these things. Um, and my plan is to, at the light board meetings, um, kind of have a take a summary list of this task force's recommendations and show how those are being addressed on an ongoing basis. I think that. Um, you know, you, you made a, a suggestion about let's check back in a year. Um, I'd rather not wait that long. I think that we have an opportunity every month at the light board to show the progress that's that's ongoing. And I, and I will take that opportunity to share that with the public. And we're also looking for other ways to market and spread the word to, to current customers and potential customers in the form of newsletters, uh, electronic or paper or otherwise. Now, uh, it was mentioned in that we used to have the bill inserts as a possibility. We still do have some customers who receive paper bills, but there's a lot that are in the Smart Hub. So, but there are, there is a whole marketing wing to Smart Hub that um, I mentioned uh, previously and that I've been working with Carol Hilton on, um, figure out how to get that set up so that she and her team can, can utilize that for broadband and for other things. <clears throat> um, just a couple other things I wanted to mention, and that was that we continue to look at grants and other funding opportunities that are outside the box. One that just came up recently was that Concord and Acton are merging uh, dispatch centers, and that's going to require Acton to connect to Concord's network in some way. So um, their project manager of this combined rec has asked for a quote to get fiber from CMLP to Acton Public Safety. So we did that for them. We, we got a third party to give us a quote, but we also uh, got a second quote, uh, which is a much more overbuilt solution that would provide a lot of additional backbone fiber for down the road. And that's something that maybe broadband could pay the difference on. It would be a very small difference because it's just a little bit of equipment, uh, but you're already got the pole attachments and all the work and all the police details already taken care of because it's required for this project. Um, so we do continue to explore uh, addition, additional and alternative funding strategies for expanding the, the network. Um, the other thing I'll mention is that we've got several highly qualified candidates for the new telecom director position. We're still in the screening uh, phase, but I can tell you we're, we're very optimistic with the candidates that we're seeing. And we're looking for somebody who doesn't just have a technical background in fiber or broadband, but somebody who really has a strong business sense and somebody who can work on the operational efficiencies that need to improve as well as uh, the marketing and um, you know focusing on the financials so that we can do those capital projects we will expand the network and not just maintain it. Mm -hmm. um, regarding the backlog, if staffing levels may, are maintained where they are now, I think there should be no problem getting through that this year. 
I agree with Gordon's statement and others that um, it's just really difficult for us to focus on marketing when we can't deliver a product. So we need to get through that backlog as soon as possible. We are engaging third-party resources to uh, pull some fiber ahead of time so that our installers can just go in and do the, the last mile to the home um, <clears throat> and set up the ONT for them. And we're also trying to streamline that process. Part of the uh, dealing with the backlog is not just throwing more people at it, but also understanding why the backlog takes so much time to get through. Uh, one of those operational inefficiencies I've found in my time overseeing broadband is that the network is not as uh, inventoried as you would like. Um, if you look at what Verizon and Comcast do, they do um, biannual audits of all of their optical networks so that if a customer says, I want service, they know at that moment if they can deliver the service. And Concord Broadband, if we get a call and somebody says, I'd like dark fiber between point A and point B, we have to send a technician or two to go do some audits to make sure fiber is there. Now, there were inventories done initially, and we do maintain an inventory, but there have been too many instances where fibers have been borrowed um, when there wasn't capacity for something else or instances where there was a, a, a break and there was a subsequent repair where fibers were taken from another group of um, you know, cluster fibers. So um, what, we, what we're left with is a situation where if a new customer signs up, our walkthrough doesn't just really include the technical aspects of that last mile, but it also includes looking at the splice case and making sure that we have the availability there and that we know which path we're gonna use. All of that could be done ahead of time so that when we get a new install, we already have all the fibers provisioned and we're ready to go. So part of you know, our winter time, I think we can use when installs are, are relatively low is working on that audit. You know, The case for against winter installs is that the fiber is brittle. We don't have a lot of slack and we can't splice indoors. So we really can't splice when it's below 40 degrees or the fiber can break. But uh, there's nothing that says we can't shine a, a light through it and test things and, and document them. And um, we've also been working on our software and, and hardware tools that we can use both in the field and in the office uh, so that we can do a better job at that maintaining that inventory going forward. Um, and then the other thing that I just want to mention was that uh, you guys mentioned this month's uh, broadband report for the light board. Um, and my hope is that that was just a glimpse of what's to come. I would like to see it greatly expanded to include a lot of the metrics that Scott and others have mentioned. Um, we, we are standardizing those metrics that we're, we're keeping. And I've been working with Matt and CSRs and others to try to get standardized reports. And I've also worked with NISC, our vendor that does billing, as well as Calix to help standardize some of these things and also better cross-reference um, the, the uh, ensure our ability to match billing with actual service delivery. Um, that's been an issue in the past where sometimes people call and, and we find out they've been getting much faster service than they thought or much slower service than they thought. And again, we can't run a business that way. Um, it's gotta be buttoned up in, in all those ways. So um, those are just a few of the things I wanted to mention. And I appreciate all the work that everyone has done. I, I appreciate the report. I did have, I, you know, I, I've read the report twice through. I made some initial like proofreading comments. Um, I feel like it will take me much longer than the amount of time that we have to provide meaningful comments, but I can say that it's a great dialogue starter for the community to take a look at and understand what their goals are. I think there's a lot of the philosophy that I really think the town needs to weigh in on in terms of universal access. Um, those are much more bigger than business decisions, and I, I'm glad that they're being discussed and brought up. And I, those are the things that I think um, are most important to find a way to continue uh, discussing, because I think operationally, um, I can tell you from my perspective, from Dave Wood's perspective, the light director, um, these are all things that we're, we want to do, that we, that we were in the process of doing, or that we think are great ideas. And we will gladly carry this torch forward and ensure that the light board and the select board get that information. Uh, but I, I do think the fundamental um, existence of your task force um, does send a message to the town, which is here is citizen input and, and let's make sure that the ship is going in the direction that the town wants. And, and, and that's what we continue to need. So I don't know what the mechanism is, but I, I definitely encourage dialogue around that, finding a way to continually get more citizen engagement and, and you know, preferably even more than we've got in this 
task force in terms of comments, in terms of reach, but just getting um, the pulse of what the average citizen wants and wants to see out of broadband in terms of access, in terms of um, you know, speeds, in terms of rates, in terms of growth, in terms of you know, leaving Concord or staying in Concord. Um, those are all things that I think the town would needs to weigh in on. Maybe the light board and the select board are um, avenues well enough for that, but you know, maybe there are other ideas too. So um, those are really all the things I wanted to say, and I'm happy to answer any questions if anyone has any. Yeah, picking up on that last point, there's um, I do think that 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 there's a broader opportunity for the impact of of a fiber network on things like sustainability, um, the ability to have programs that support affordable housing, is something that that's missed. I've tried to speak to that in numerous occasions now at the at the monthly chairs breakfast, but I I do also find that you know people that are there to do affordable housing are thinking about you know putting a roof over somebody's head more than they're maybe thinking about helping them get a job working from, from that home using using broadband and we we all often need some cases on that i wanted to circle back to one other thing because i think that the the partnerships or potential partnerships with adjacent communities like Acton. Um, we already have the one with Carlisle where they're, you know, they're connected and the public safety radio network comes through there and comes right back to the tower that's just over my shoulder here, over here. Um, but I was going to mention that it's also something that's often overlooked that um, the, the um, you know, Great Road Route 2A is serviced by the Concord Water Department out, you know, going up past the light plant and, and going all the way over there. And we have a, a major, you know, I'd call it, I guess an aqueduct is a water main anyway, that goes all the way out to Nagog Pond. And it's been uh, an ongoing problem and expense for the water department to extend their SCADA system to control both the pumping station at where the Bruce Freeman Rail Trail crosses crosses Route 2A, and and at the at the water treatment facility, which is getting a huge investment, and so if there's any opportunity to merge those requirements into something that also helps the public safety network, it, I think it just builds on some of the benefits that that were called out in the executive summary about how much value this network has provided. Um, to things like to the other utility services specifically, um, the water sewer and, and as well as public safety, and you know I think it it bears noting and, and highlighting that that's one of the real community benefits of, of having a network like this in the first place is that you can get there and then um, obviously the commercial opportunities for for offering you know the broadband service to the various uh, businesses up along 2A, you know, so I do think that there's, you know, there's room there and that construction, the, the costs for communicating with the Magog Pond water treatment facility have, have always, it, the communication has been terrible. It's, it's difficult and, and error prone and, and poor and it needs to get better. And, and so that might be another partner in, in, in pushing forward to that if you haven't already thought of it. I was going to say the same thing. Sorry. Go ahead, Jason. Oh, I was just going to say, we actually talked about that today. We had a, a meeting today with a vendor for the advanced metering system, uh, at the light plant. And, you know, on their map, they're showing all the, the nodes necessary to, re to receive uh, metering data. And you can see the map going all the way uh, deep into Acton, where, where we have water customers um, that we need to meter and the challenge of getting to those. And so um, I did mention the fiber and both to act in public safety and also the potential for additional fiber that could both serve that facility uh, at, at Nagog and also the customers reading meter data and also, you know, potentially providing uh, broadband for customers along to it. Yeah. I think those are all, you know, that those early conversations with, you know, there's the, 
sort of nation, nascent opportunity for some regionalization. And some of these communities also don't, aren't particularly well served for broadband. So there's a deeper, much longer term question about, you know, if the, you know, we've talked a lot about take rate and if we ever decided that, you know, this network, you know, there wasn't enough customer base in Concord in the first place to, you know, there's, there is some opportunities. I think some of these other communities might also be interested in, in making that investment. And it starts with, it starts with some of those cooperative projects, I think, it's, you know, that's, that builds the base on which other things can be done. Um, so in, I, I appreciate all of those comments and thank you for taking the time to look at I'd like to um I'd like yeah, to express uh, my thanks Jason of uh, <laughs> I couldn't type fast enough I'm gonna have to go back to the recording <laughs> but yeah um very well thought out and, and to me it was extremely extremely encouraging to know that what we're thinking about what we're concerned about is being heard and being considered seriously I think that's you know I think that's to me that's a big win uh, you guys are smart guys. It sounds like you're, you know, that you're starting to think about these things and that you're in this role now. And I'm very encouraged. I'll just say it that way. Sure. <clears throat> Any other comments from, from the committee? I'm, I'm very encouraged too. And uh, thank you very much, Jason, for all of the great stuff that you and your team, um, everybody over there at the light plant um, have taken on with this. You know, I, one of the things you described was like, uh, just made me think of how if you're an employee, you could be working on something, but it's like above your pay grade, so to speak. And so you have to run it to your boss. Well, then actually in, in Concord, it actually does hit kind of a higher level where it's the, it's the, it's the residents, it's this, it's the town folk, it's the people that attend town meeting that, that are the boss. And that could actually be, and empowering that that the citizens can actually empower you guys to take on uh, bigger bigger goals, audacious goals, and and take on something bigger. So I hope that in that sense that we're we're um, empowering you. And um, and anyway, thank you very much. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Thank you all. Yeah. But if there are any um, any editorial kinds of things, especially if you find anything that that feel that you feel needs to be corrected, I'm more than happy to take those in whatever form so that we can, uh, you know, improve the draft and it, particularly in, in you know any areas that it needs needs help from an accuracy perspective. I would be um, more than happy to. Jason, do you have a word copy of the of the draft report that you can mark up for us? Um, I've been marking up a PDF copy with annotations and comments, and I can send that along. That'd be great. Yeah. Okay. Um, with that, so for next steps, what I would appreciate is that uh, I would like to think that we have some some things in front of us um, by next Thursday's meeting that represent some you know suggestions for um additions changes um I, i'd like to ask each of you to you know focus on your own sections that you worked on directly and and consider whether there's any changes that you would propose for that but it you know certainly don't constrain yourself to that if if there's some you know some work to do in other sections i definitely plan to work on the um the question of you know how to get a, a, a debt schedule that that might make sense um i think that that's you know and and maybe how to initiate the, the capital planning portion of things because i do think that we need to put a little bit of a stake in the ground about even even if it's just a straw man about what a what a capital program might look like um based on some assumptions about the about the subscriber rates and so forth going forward. So I, I'd like us to spend some time looking at that. The goal would be to sort of agree to what those changes are going to be um, at next Thursday's meeting and then um, implement them in a, in a round of, uh, of 
you know, similar to what I what we did before when we published a draft, some um, some final copies and and you know su submitted out for comments and reactions from each of you, and then we we'd have something to publish by um, you know virtual town meeting May first week of May ish, and then I think after that it you know I think the a good question is. Um, you know, who should we should we go around and talk? Is there is there a deck or some 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 uh, some you know as a short letter kind of cover letter that that goes back? I believe our charge actually says, and I should have checked this before the meeting, but it says to report back to the select board and the town manager. So I think that that's where we need to officially drop to. Any questions or comments on that schedule? None on that. Um, All right. Any... Yeah, I guess we're good. Yeah. Okay. I have a question on, on that schedule. Yes, Terry. So I do have it down for one of the select board items after May 1st, after town meeting, mm -hmm. that when the time is right for you guys and for the select board that we you come in and present your report and we have a discussion. Okay. If, if that's what you're planning. Um, we'll, we'll have a new chair by then, but um, what I'm doing is um, arranging topics to send okay. um, off to the next chair. So I have been assuming that you would want to come in and discuss this report with the select board. Okay. And in the meantime, it sounds like your draft report is going to be completed on April 28th or soon after that. And then are you looking for public comments after after April 28th? Um, certainly we, we could take comments, I think through, you know, through any period. We don't have time scheduled, but I think if we get get comments, we, we could do that or we could schedule a, a meeting in May. Uh, I'm not sure what the select board's meeting schedule is, is going to look like, but I, you know, I'm anticipating that it would make sense to do that. I think that coming out of the light board meeting, there was a there was a thought that maybe we would come back there and discuss that in a little bit more detail. Because if you, um, we we sort of dropped the report, came in, and you know, the draft report came in, talked to them about what was in it, and then had that that public meeting, but we haven't really had given them a chance to to ask us whatever questions or, you know, and I think I do anticipate that we're gonna sharpen our sort of suggestions about maybe what the light board should specifically do with this. Uh, I do see that this, this is being, in many cases, mostly theirs, although I do think the capital policy things may, may flow more towards the select board and maybe even with a recommendation that the FinCom think about these things a little bit more. Okay, well, um, I've, I've looked through the draft report um, and read the um, executive summary and the recommendations and it, it's really coming along very well. A lot of work has gone into it. And I was at the forum last week and um, appreciate Jason um, talking with the other staff and, and getting all of that organized. That's just great. So things are really moving along. And I guess I just would like a sense from this committee on how you want to proceed with the public and with the select board. Mm -hmm. if there's anything that you want the public to know, like they have 30 days to comment, or, or maybe you just want to keep it informal, just post it and see if you get comments. Um, our, our select board meetings are May 9th and 23rd, and then there'll be two in June. So we're, you know, we're willing to accommodate the committee. Just let us know okay. what we're looking for. I can, I can say that I, I know I'm going to be out of town on May 9th. Yeah, I don't think it'll be the 9th at this point. Yeah. It'll probably be like decompression meeting from town, town meeting. So maybe targeting the 23rd makes sense. And if we publish that, should give people some time to make comments and, and. Okay. Okay, let's let's think. Oh, that was May twenty third. 
Yeah. Well, if this is very tentative right now. Um, no, I just I'm trying to just put it in the notes here. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, um, uh, it's got a whole time has gone by, but I wanted to mention one one other edit that I think based on the feedback we have and uh, just maybe people could think about that. And there's a lot of at least a couple comments or different places about the total length of this report. Um, and I'm not actually suggesting that we start hacking away at it. I'm not sure it's worthwhile, but if we tighten up the executive summary recommendation and make sure people's attention is called to that, that might be something we can consider. Um, the next thing one can do is start pushing things into the appendices that are part of the body, but I'm not, I don't think that's worth doing at this time with it, so. One comment that says that the same topic appeared five times at different places. So there could be some actual um, constructive, useful um, editorial, uh, you know, editorial changes uh, just mm -hmm. to tighten it up. Yeah, I, I, I probably helped contribute to that because I know that I, I put some things in the financial recommendations that might have belonged somewhere else just because mm -hmm. I was running late. So. Yeah, was that the was that the comment about take rate, Gordon? I think, I think we. I just remember. I um, feel like we do. Matt Johnson yeah. uh, counted off a few things. I don't think it was specific to take rate. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll go back. This and... item occurs five times, so I, I thought that was. I appreciated the reader taking the effort to count them up. <laughs> <laughs> Great deal of attention, perhaps more than. But the uh, I mean, I he also it. commented. He also commented about why why wasn't five G discussed in this, and this was something that we had discussed and agreed on, and was beyond the scope of 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 our committee charge and our direction. So, and in fact, Matt was probably part of that discussion that gave us that charge. So yeah, well, actually, there could be a section of the report that explains that. Yeah, it wouldn't it have to be very. Yeah, long. I mean, it could be the standard fair is to put it in, you know, scope statement and out of scope. You know, yeah, it's a very simple absolutely. thing. It's out of scope. Sorry. I think yeah. there's, I, I think there's something. I, I appreciate the comments about it's long, but I also sort of think that at some level, what we're creating is a kind of a historical point in time. Mm -hmm. status of where things stand today and um there's something there's some value to sort of collecting and having it all in one place so that people in the in the future who are trying to think about these things can you know and i have a comment about that as well mark in a slightly different vein you know people have been concerned for those that were concerned about whether this work was worthwhile or we should we do this blah 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 there's enough meat here that the, that that report turned out to be rather substantial, and that that is the answer to why this is important and why, in fact, why ten minutes out of the light board meeting may not be enough. Mm -hmm. This is not it's not it's not a trivial subject, and there's a lot of nuances to it, as we've all learned, or yeah. continue to learn, and continue to know, and you know that's that is the nature of the beast and it, and i think it's actually just demonstrated by by both the broadness of the subjects in the report the length of the report how much time we've spent on it we've all been investing at least one day a week for some long period of time here um it's not a simple thing yeah. well with all of that i'll i'll ask you to invest a little bit more time over the next week and you know come make some suggestions about your sections i think the you know the, Probably starting with the with the Word document version of the final that it's already been distributed. If you need it in some other format, contact me directly about that. And I think with that, it's um, eight twenty six. I'm probably ready to take some public comments if there are any, and uh, we'll wrap up for this evening. <clears throat> and seeing none, I'm going to say uh, I would. Happily. I'll move for adjourning. Thank you, Scott. A second. Oh, look at that. It's, it's the I, same I as the last time there. I did it. <laughs> I knew you'd get there, Gail. I was counting on you. 
<laughs> okay, uh, we'll take a roll call vote. Uh, Gordon Brockway. Aye. Uh, Dave, Scott Hopkinson. Aye. David Hessel. Aye. Gail Heyer. Aye. And myself, Mark Howell. Thank you for your participation tonight. By the Thank way, you. folks, I'm going to hold off sending the minutes because I want to listen to Jason's comments on YouTube and make sure that I captured the relevant points. Jason, if you wanted to send me your speaking notes, I'd be great, but that's up to you. Um, I can also, do that. For those yeah. of you who are interested, I, I will forward a, a, um, a, an email with a link to the actual recording from the, the public meeting we held because I noticed that's not up on YouTube yet uh, for anybody that wants to you know, review those because there were some interesting comments there and I know I wasn't taking a lot of good notes trying to be present for the meeting. So um, I, I wanna go back and listen to that, that I just got that in, in the last day or so. Actually, that would, I think I'm responsible for the minutes there. So that would help me so, a lot. Thanks. Yeah, look for that. Uh, I just got it. So with that, we'll say good night. Thanks. Good night. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, folks.